age of rampant fantasy lions. Today we're going to talk about doing a mashup of these two rule sets. For those of you that don't know, Age of Fantasy is a free rule set available at OnePageRules.com. The Rampant Family of Games by Daniel Mersey is part of the Osprey Blue Book series. And I think there may be an opportunity for doing a little bit of a mashup. Spoiler alert, I don't think this is going to work. But before we get into why I don't think this is going to work, let me reassure you that we don't believe in theory crafting here in the House of Wargaming. When experience speaks, let theory be silent. We're going to essentially lay out an experiment. We're going to theorize why this is not a really good match. But then in an upcoming video, we're going to put our theory to the test and we're going to find out if it really does work better than I expect. So before I begin, let me just explain how Age of Fantasy works for those of you who are not aware of this free rule set. The rules fit onto two pages. This is really more of a quick reference sheet. You can buy the full rules for $0 at OnePageRules.com. You download them all. There's like a Patreon. You can give them 5 bucks a week and get a whole bunch of free of the STL files to print your own armies. But we're not talking about the miniatures today, we're talking about the rules. And the rules of the game are pretty simple. It's uh, an I go, you go system by unit. I move one of my units, you move one of yours. I move one of mine, you move one of yours. Oh look, it's starting to run because I just printed this up. When you activate a unit, they automatically activate. And they move in basically six inch increments. You can hold and shoot, you can advance and shoot after you move. You can rush forward or you can charge that allows you to move 12 inches. It's built for a 4x6 table. Pretty standard stuff. The combat system is a roll to hit, roll to wound, maybe roll to save. Well, regenerate is what this rule set calls it. Not everybody has regenerate. Some people have, have the ability to ignore wounds that they've already taken. It's basically a roll to save mechanic. It's pretty simple. But the rule set itself is designed around the idea that you are going to play four turns. I should also point out the activation is alternating. I move one of my units, you move one of yours. I, I might have already said that, but it might have been in a, a different take. So I felt it was worthwhile to say it again. As a result of that, there's a lot less sitting around than a true I go, you go by team side. And there's a lot of analysis that goes into, do I really want to move my archers up into position to fire now, or do I want to wait for him to move his guys so that my archers can move, and then on the next turn, they'll get an extra shot off. It's a great game, a lot of fun, but the core rules themselves are built around a objective securing victory situation. You lay out three to five victory markers, and at the end of the game, whoever has secured the most markers wins. Also, as I said, I think, the game is designed for four turns. By the time I move all my guys and you move yours and we do that four times, the game is essentially over. And the game is pretty bloody. Remember, it's built for a four by six table. So what winds up happening is I have found that by the end of the third turn, it's probably pretty clear who's going to win. On a four by six table, if people can charge 12 inches and you're deploying up to 12 inches onto the table... You can cover that first half of the table in a single move. So by the end of the second turn, you're already well into your opponent's deployment. Like, you can get completely across the table after by the end of turn two, if you were so inclined. Is that right? 12? 24? 30. No, it would take uh, turn three. But that gives you, like, basically two turns in which you can be running around your opponent's deployment zone. Assuming, of course, that you are deployed along the long edge, the long axis, which is generally going to be the case. Well, okay, so now the question is, what happens when you play a dozen games and you're tired of just securing those three to five random objective markers? And that's where our old friend Dan Mersey enters the chat with Lion and Dragon Rampant. Now, I'm mostly going to look at Lion Rampant because there's six scenarios in Dragon Rampant that might work, but we're going to ignore those because... They're not quite as cool. They're not quite as varied. Lion Rampant has a total of A through L. That's 12 scenarios for you to cut your teeth on. That's a lot of replayability for this game. But it's important to notice that the activation system for Lion Rampant is a nominated unit. And then depending on what orders you're giving them, you may or may not be able to activate that unit. You make basically like a morale check. 
And if they don't activate, uh-oh, your turn is over, which means that a turn can go by with you only moving one or two units. Compare that to being able to move every unit every turn in Age of Fantasy. What that really means is that a four-turn game of Lion Rampant might see most of your army not even move, likewise for your opponent. So you're going to have a whole lot more turns going on in Lion Rampant, and that's where I think the ability to use these scenarios falls apart. Because these scenarios posit that you are going to be playing 8, 10, maybe 12 turns. And in those 12 turns, everybody is going to get to activate maybe once. Like, not everybody's going to activate every turn. So you have scenarios like get a guy across the table that it might take him 6, 7, 8 turns to get across the table. Well, 6, 7, 8 turns in Age of Fantasy could take a long time. Bear in mind that activation system operates on both sides of the table. Yeah, I'm failing a lot to get my guy moving across the table, but my opponent is only able to move a few units per turn. Their motivation isn't quite as 100% reliable as Age of Fantasy, which means he's going to struggle to get his guys into roadblocking position. You won't have that same struggle here in Age of Fantasy. You have very different games with very different activation systems, and I'm not sure that a scenario from Lion Rampant could even work in Age of Fantasy. Scenario F is a very popular scenario. This is not your standard line them up and fight scenario. This is one where there is a defender in the center of the table. He has four objective markers placed roughly in the center of the table and one unit standing there in the middle. Well, it, it, it says here four points, but that's mostly going to be one unit. Trying to prevent the opponent from burning those four making an activation to fire those four locations. They could be, you know, little bungalows, little huts, little houses, could be haystacks, could be barrels of supplies and ammunition and whatnot. So the attacker has to get one model into contact with the unit at the start, and as an ordered activation, he may try to set fire. Well, what, what does that mean to try to take an action in a game like Age of Fantasy, where every action that you nominate is, is going to happen? The scenario ends when all four of the objectives are set on fire or until the attacker has lost half his retinue's points. This basically just devolves in Age of Fantasy to a standard try to kill half your opponents. I think. I gotta set it up. I gotta line up my armies and I gotta see how that's gonna work out in play. Because that rule that the attacker has to try to preserve half of his force might just mean that he can't send an all-or-nothing attack in, into the objectives. That may be the difference. So it says here, at the end of uh, this turn, the game ends as the attacker. And then it gives you points. Basically, if the attacker burns three, then he wins the game. Uh, and then don't worry about boasts. That's a little subsystem that works pretty good. I think you can see the point here. Now, it's also worth mentioning... Since we're already mashing up two rule sets, these might this might not be peanut butter and chocolate. This is not to say that it's impossible to use this scenario in Age of Fantasy. It's just to say that you might need to spend a little bit of time thinking about how to make this scenario work. There may be other adjustments that need to occur. You may need to decide, and again, I'll go back to the fact that it, a typical four-turn game of Age of Fantasy, if I'm playing about a thousand points... Which, oh, I'm actually going to be playing a 750 point force for Age of Fantasy. This could take an hour, hour and a half to go through the four turns. What if I need to get through eight turns? Well, I'm not going to be able to get through every activation for every figure in eight turns in a reasonable amount of time. I, I Reasonable. In the amount of time that I'm comfortable making videos. Getting the video done in about 45 minutes, that's about an hour, hour and a half of play time. However, you may be able to port in an activation attempt Take a look at our mummified undead. Notice that our skeleton warriors have a quality of five up. You may decide that you have to nominate, you alternate nominating units to go, and they have to pass a quality check before they even move. That may be the solution. And the fact that you are playing not just one turn, but you can, you're, you're, that you're not playing the standard four turn game might make this a reasonable assumption, a reasonable rule to play. 
Yes, they're only going to be able to activate, my skeleton warriors, for example, are only going to be able to activate one turn out of every three. But if I'm playing a 12-turn game, they're going to get four activations on average, which is the same as in a standard game of Age of Fantasy. Likewise, my royal champion, he may decide that he's only going to be activating once every other turn. And what that means is it empowers, and I just realized this as I'm cutting this video, that empowers your high-quality troops. Playing a 12-turn scenario means that your royal champion isn't just better stat-wise here, but he's going to get six activations to just five, three, what did I say, four, six to four out of your skeleton warriors. And if you have anybody... Do I have anybody on the other side? I have some Havoc Warriors here. Uh, they've got a quality of... Oh, no, I take it back. With a quality three up, he's going to get eight activations, right? He's activating two-thirds of the time. Your Havoc Ogres are only going to activate six turns. But if you have anybody who's a quality of six, which it doesn't look like I have here, but they're only going to get two activations out of that entire game. And the points are not set up to factor in that the Royal Champion will be able to activate twice as often as the Skeleton Warriors. So that may be another thing to consider if you do try to mash up these two rule sets and use quality as a means of activation. I wouldn't concern myself too much with that, though, because remember that when we talk about a balancing situation... For, for a scenario like I have here where I will be running Havoc Warriors versus the Mummified Undead, the Havoc Master and the Royal Champion both have a quality of 3-up. So the fact that your leader is activating twice as often as your general warriors balances out by the fact that both sides get that extra buff and power-up. All it really does is change your strategy that you might implement as the player. Cost, powers, activations, number of actions, game length, how long it takes to play the game in terms of hours and minutes, all of these are critical factors in balancing a scenario. And oddly enough, now that we've walked through that little process, analyzed it together, I bounced some ideas off you, I've convinced myself this might actually work after all. We are going to play as many turns as it takes, but we will use an activation system. We'll pull that out of Lion Rampant. As long as we're pulling out the scenarios, we might as well pull that too. So to save some time in the next video, and because we have a few minutes left over here, let me go down the rosters real quick. The Havoc Warriors are led by a Havoc Master, Quality 3, Defense 3. He does have Toughness 3. He is a Conqueror, which means he has, he has Dark March. That's an ability that he gives to his boys that they can move a little bit quicker. We have a Harbinger of Chaos. That's the big fat-bellied red guy here. This this demon. Can we, can we pick up the color there, camera? Yeah, there we go. Okay. Uh, this is an Alternative Armies figure. Uh, most of these guys are from... Uh, this is a mix of Alternative Armies, the undead over here, and oh, I think that's where most of them come from. Uh, these giant guys over here are from the Demon World 18 millimeter line, and then these Havoc Warriors are from mostly, I want to say Rebel Miniatures has a fantasy. Is it Rebel or, um, I don't know, it might be Splinter Light. I'm not worried about that. So we have a unit of warriors over here. That's these five guys here. And they have uh, Quality 3, Defense 3. They have a Sergeant and a Chosen Warrior leading them. We've got two units of Havoc Ogres. That's I know this is really a troll. He, he counts as an ogre for this. One unit and two units. The Havoc Ogres are Quality 3, Defense 3. They both have a Sergeant. They all have tough three, so there's a lot of wounds in there. And then, uh, as I said, the Harbinger of Havoc. Let's finish him off. He's got Stomp, a Demon Spear, and a Demon Gauntlet. He flies. He's got Caster 2. We will have some magical dueling going on because the Mummified Undead, of course, are led by a Royal Champion, Caster 3. Quality 3, Defense 4, Toughness 3. He's undead. Everybody over here is undead. I'm not going to say that over and over again. we got two units of 10 Spearmen with Musician, Banner, Sergeant. Is that all they got? They got sergeants, and that's about it. The skeleton archers also have a sergeant. I thought they had... I think they have a champion. Yeah, and a musician. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they get all the little fun little special abilities. And then we have a skeleton giant. He's terrifying. Fear 2, toughness 12. Quality 3... Excuse me. Quality 4, defense 3, toughness 12. That's a lot of wounds, baby. He's going to be hard to take down. You're going to have to do... 
Man, what is it? It's, how do wounds work? You're going to have to do a tremendous amount of damage to that guy before he wanders off the board. He does not have any distance combat. I, I know my figure looks like he's throwing a rock. He's just going to be pounding guys into the ground like, like nails. That's all. So that's what our scenario looks like. I don't know who's going to be trying to defend what. We'll figure that out. Probably have... Maybe we'll just declare these guys are going to be defending the sausages with mustard. I'll throw out four piles of skulls. That's what the Havoc Warriors are trying to destroy. And tune in next time to find out whether our little experiment works. Can you use other rule scenario sets with one-page rules? I think you can. You just got to think about it a little bit and tweak things here and there. Till then, I'm Mr. Wargaming, and I'm praying for you.